Hello, everyone. I am pleased to have with me today Dr. Vishal Mangalvadi, born in 1949. Dr. Mangalvadi is founder president of the Book of the Millennium International slash Revelation movement. He's an Indian philosopher and social reformer, born and raised in India. Vishal studied philosophy at the University of Allahabad, 1967 to 1969, and Indore, 1971 to 73 in Hindu ashrams and at the Labrie Fellowship in Switzerland in 1976. Along with his wife, Ruth, he founded a community to serve the rural poor in India. Vishal continued his direct involvement in community transformation until 1997, including service at the headquarters of two national political parties. There, he worked toward the empowerment and liberation of Indian peasants and the lower castes, in 1977, Asia's then largest publisher, Vikas Publishing House, published his first book, The World of Gurus. His next two books, When the New Age Gets Old, IVP 1992, and India, The Grand Experiment, Hippa Ran 1997, brought his work to the attention of American and European readers. At the turn of the millennium, Vishal and his wife Ruth were invited to the U.S. to make a television series exploring the Bible's role in creating the modern world. Their research, prepared in, in the process of making a documentary film, has been presented in text form and on a variety of electronic and social media platforms. He's lectured in more than 40 countries and published 17 books, served as the Honorary Professor of Applied Theology in the Gospel and Plough Faculty of Theology, the Sam Higginbottom Institute of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences in Allahabad, India, since 2013. I recently read two of his newer books, The Book That Made Your World and Thomas Nelson, 2011. And in what is some ways a companion volume and an extension, this book changed everything, sought after press media, 2019. It was very interesting to me to encounter the views of a non-Westerner on, non on the biblical corpus and its effects on, well, its broad effects on civilization. Um, I was also extremely impressed and happy to have had the opportunity to read books that were so uh, deeply researched and widely ranging. I learned all sorts of things about Western history and certainly a lot about Indian history. Things I, I had no idea about. So ignorant when it comes to history that it's embarrassing. So it was a pleasure to encounter these books and to get some sense of the depth and breadth of scholarship that went into their production. I thought we could have a pretty interesting conversation on the, well, on the history of India, on the role the Bible played in shaping India as a modern country, on your views of the Bible and the West, all of that. So welcome to my discussion. Thank you, sir. I'm honored. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. So um, can you maybe start by telling everyone how you came across the Bible and why you've made it, in some ways, I would say, the centerpiece of your life, its study? Yes. While I was studying uh, philosophy in Allahabad University, I <clears throat> couldn't have any childish faith because my professors uh, did not believe the Bible or Hindu scriptures. <clears throat> My, I had become a Christian as a teenager because I was going through a moral struggle. I was addicted to shoplifting and lying. And I hated myself for this habit of lying when there was nothing to be gained from lying. And I would meditate and try and control my tongue. But in the evening, when I look back on the day, I have just deceived everybody. That was habit. And uh, I will try and have more willpower to control myself uh, until someone explained to me that your problem is not will, lack of willpower. You're quite stubborn. Uh, you have a disease. It's called sin that rules you. But there is a good news that there is a savior who can save you from sin. So I asked Jesus to deliver me from my habit of lying, but he also went ahead and delivered me from my habit of stealing. I was able to go back to the shops from where I had stolen and offer restitution. Thankfully, nobody took the money, 
they were all pleased. These were little things that I had. How told. old were you? How old were you uh, when you did when, when I was about fourteen or so? I was still a teenager, uh, struggling with this moral struggle. Why so do you I think? Th why do you think it was that turning to Christianity actually worked when when your own attempts hadn't hadn't produced any positive results? Well, that is actually a very good question because uh, I had already realized that my attempt to control my tongue, I hadn't heard the word addiction. I didn't know what addiction was, <clears throat> what it meant. So I just uh, thought that I had these terrible habits and I knew they were wrong. I didn't know how to get out of them. And so when I was told that there is a savior who came to save sinners like me, uh, as a child, I believed and I asked Jesus uh, to forgive my sins and to change me. So the transformation was real. I got very excited. You know, it's not easy to go back to the shops and confess that right. you had stolen. So the transformation was real. But at the university, I found that I couldn't really believe the Bible to be true. Uh, that was nobody was directly attacking the Bible in the university, but my professors were obviously a lot more learned than my pastors. And if the professors didn't believe the Bible, why should I follow the pastors? So it was easy to doubt the Bible. The difficult question was, what then do you believe? Hmm. And I decided that I'm going to believe what the best philosophers and scientists believe. So what do they think is the truth? I began reviewing my course, uh, reviewing all the notes, all the books, and I began to realize that my professors knew, that the philosophers knew that they didn't know the truth and that they could not know the truth. So by 1969, philosophy departments in India uh, already knew that uh, the Enlightenment had failed uh, the, the, nobody in any university believed that I know the truth and I can teach the truth. So I began to feel that perhaps the Buddha was right. I come from the same people group as the Buddha and his parable of the five blind men trying to make sense of an elephant and fighting that elephant is like a pillar or like a wall or like a rope. Uh, we all have some truth but that is relative truth, relative to our experience of the elephant. Uh, none of us uh, really know the truth. None of us really know the elephant. So I thought that perhaps the Buddha was right. And we should be humble enough in knowing that none of us know the truth. And we should listen to each other rather than fighting with each other. But that raised the question that if the five blind men are there who uh, do not know the elephant, could there be a sixth person who is not blind, who sees the elephant, and who can communicate to me of what I'm experiencing of the elephant? So obviously, the concept of blindness exists because there are someone who is not blind. So the sight must exist for the concept of blindness to exist. So I decided, is there someone who knows the truth? Has he spoken? So this started on my quest, the philosophical quest to see. I first went to uh, the Hindu, uh, the um, Gita Press Gurukul that sells Hindu scriptures and asked them for a copy of the Vedas, the most ancient sacred Hindu scriptures, which are supposed to be revelation. And I was amazed that uh, the, uh, my professors, of course, had been taught, teaching us the philosophy of the Vedas, but they never brought a copy of the Vedas into the classroom. And uh, I had never seen a copy of the Vedas. So uh, I went to buy one and I was told that, sorry, the Vedas are not printed. They cannot be translated. I was surprised to learn that actually Sanskrit never had a script. Uh, because it was oral language so with sophisticated uh, grammar, uh, but no script. So the Vedas were not supposed to be written down. Uh, they were to be memorized, but, and memorizing was not enough. You needed correct enunciation and pronunciation and intonation and when to offer uh, the melted butter into the fire, etc., the rituals. That was the purpose. 
So Vedas were never written to know the truth. And in fact, the Upanishad, uh, 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 which followed the Vedas, uh, Mundaka Upanishad, for example, which, from which our national motto comes, which is Satya Mev Jayate, truth alone triumphs. Uh, the Upanishad says uh, that no amount of study of the Vedas will ever lead you to truth because the Vedas are not written to give you knowledge or wisdom of truth. They are magical sounds uh, composed to give you power. So I said, well, it will be very nice to have some power, but right now I'm looking for truth. So I went to uh, the Muslim books because I was in a city called Allahabad, uh, which is a Persian name, Abode of Allah. This city was established by Muslims. Just two years ago, its name was changed to a Hindu name. Uh, but at that time, it was still uh, seen as a Muslim city. And I was surprised that the Quran was not available, neither in my mother tongue, which is India's national language, Hindi, or Urdu, which was the language of my town, uh, which is the na national language of uh, um, Pakistan right now. So the Quran was not available. The shopkeepers explained to me that you have to study um, Arabic to study Quran. So I said, well, it would be very nice to know a foreign language, but at this moment, I'm not interested in studying a language. If the Quran is God's word, why is it not available to me in my language? So it was my older sister who encouraged me to read the Bible. And I said to uh, her that I've already read the Bible. I think these are childish stories. So, so she said, no, 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 you were a child when you read it. Uh, now you think you are a philosopher. So read it as a critical philosopher. And as I began rereading the Bible, uh, I found Genesis very exciting because it was answering questions uh, that the university had not answered about who, who am I? What is man? Yeah, well, in your in your book, one of the things you do quite nicely, um, a couple of comments on what you've said. I mean, you make a, a, a quite a remarkable and insightful case, I would say, for the particulars of the vision of man that's embedded in Genesis. And I found that interesting. It, your ideas, in some sense, paralleled ideas I was developing in a course or a lecture series I did in the Bible that... God contends with chaos to make order and that man is, and women are made, man and woman are made in the, in that image. And there's a, a, a um, imputed nobility to the human character that's part and parcel of the initial Genesis story. You also make a case that, and you were beginning to develop that just now again, that um, the universal translation of the Bible has had a revolutionary worldwide effect on every culture really that it's touched and that that effect of the book itself, not necessarily the people who transmitted the book, but sometimes them too, that that effect was fundamentally positive, that it led to uh, an increased appreciation for the dignity and worth and nobility of, of men and women alike, regardless of their economic status or background. That's absolutely right. And we are in the same wavelength at that point. Uh, but uh, later, as I kept reading up to say books like Leviticus, I found the Bible very boring, very boring book. But when I came into the uh, old historical books of Kings and Chronicles, then I was really fed up. Uh, here I am an Indian young man. I do not know enough about Indian history. Why am I reading this Jewish book? Um, and as I was ready to close down the Bible once and for all, the uh, something amazing happened, which was that uh, Indian history at school level uh, is always telling us how good, great, glorious, wonderful our ancestors and our rulers was. This Jewish book in Kings and Chronicles was telling me how rotten the Jewish kings were. So I realized, of course, this is not court history. Kings didn't pay historians to write about their fathers. So this must be religious history of the Jews, which is critical of the politicians, because in India, the religious leaders are Brahmins, politicians are Kshatriyas. There's always rivalry between them. So I said, this must be a religious book. So just to confirm my opinion of what the Bible is, I began rereading these historical books. 
And I was amazed that the book is condemning Jewish religious leaders to the point that God hated them. He destroyed his temple. He killed the priests. He sent them into slavery. So I said, okay, then the Bible must be subaltern history written from the point of view of simple uh, Jewish people, men and women and children who uh, uh, are exploited both by religious and political leaders. But then, uh, as I <laughs> began rereading these books, I realized, no, uh, this book is incredible. It is more anti-Semitic than anything Hitler could have written. It is saying that every Jew was an idolater, adulterer, liar, cheater, deceiver, etc. God hated the people. He destroyed his chosen people, sent them into slavery to Assyria and to Babylon. So then I said, well, this must be the point of view of the prophets, because prophets mm -hmm. love to condemn everybody. Uh, that's people would accuse you and me of being that kind of uh, voice. So uh, here, I already know that these are very boring books. And within a period of two months, I'm looking through Samuel King's and Chronicles for the fifth time to just confirm my point of view that this is the word of prophets. Uh, but then I was amazed that the book is saying most of the prophets were false prophets. The good ones were the losers. They were trying to mm. save their nation. They couldn't save themselves. They were beaten, killed, thrown into cisterns, etc. Right. So you're making the case that it's not easy to read those books as the expression of any given dominant group or power or or exploitative group or even viewpoint other than other than what? Other than an attempt to lay out some some fundamental ethical truth? Well, it was a widow in um the north of Israel, uh, a Sidonian widow, who opened my eyes. Elijah is running away from his own king. The king says, you are a troubler of Israel. Because of you, there is three years of famine. Uh, he was hiding in a brook, uh, drinking water from there. The Bible says the crows were bringing his food. The, the brook dried out. So he was sent to this widow of Zarephath, and uh, Elijah says, please, can you bring me some water? And she goes, you know, he's been on a long journey. He shouts at her, please also bring me a loaf of bread. She says, now that's going too far. I have just a little bit of flour. I'm going to make the last meal, my, me and my son, we eat that, after that we die. He says, no, 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 you won't die. Make a loaf for me. Besides yourself and your son, she does. So she invites him to stay because she realizes that she actually had more flour than she thought. Next morning, she still has flour and oil. And next evening and the third day and the fourth day. And she begins to feel this guy is a magician. He's multiplying my uh, limited flour. And she's very pleased to have him as the house guest. But then her son becomes sick and dies. And she's really angry at Elijah that I'm a sinner. Did you as a man of God come here to judge me? I have nothing. I have no husband. I have no jewelry. I have no pots and pans. I have no savings, no insurance. This boy was my only hope. And now he is dead uh, because of you. So Elijah takes her, him, the boy up, prays for him. The, and asks God that my whole nation condemns me as a troubler of Israel. Now you have brought trouble upon this woman also. So the boy is resurrected. The woman, when he brings the son back, the woman says, now I know that you are a man of God. And the words of the Lord from your mouth, mouth are true. Now, my professors have no concept of truth. Can the words communicate truth? The Buddha doesn't believe, Upanishads don't believe that human words can communicate truth. But a widow knows that you are a man of God. The word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. So I began to look into these old uh, historical books. And I realized that whatever my interpretation, the book itself is claiming to be God's word. 
Yeah, well, one of the things that you do a nice job of, I would say, in contrast to maybe maybe postmodern perspectives in particular, is to make the case that the biblical narrative um, is predicated on the idea that there is a truth that words can aspire to, and words can contain that truth, and that human beings can possess those words. So the, the words can refer to something that's real and absolute and fundamentally true. And we're graced in some sense by the ability to partake in that process. And that words have a world engendering force as well. And so I, I thought that defense of, of the biblical perspective was extremely, is extremely, what would you say, necessary and welcome in today's world, because as you point out, it isn't the conclusion of modern philosophers, especially of the more radical type, that words refer to anything at all outside of themselves, or that words can contain anything reasonably approximating some kind of transcendent truth. Yes, that's what I learned studying Wittgenstein. Uh, Burton Russell said that Wittgenstein was the greatest British philosopher of the first part of the 20th century. And his philosophy of linguistic analysis, he begins with assuming that the words have something to do with truth. Some words can communicate truth. But by the time he's done, he has come to realize uh, that words uh, have nothing to do with truth. The words lead to words and more words and more words. So after that, the Western Enlightenment philosophy becomes anti-philosophy. It's not a pursuit of truth, uh, but it's a pursuit of um, myth-making, uh, story-making. Uh, uh, but uh, so, uh, so you have existentialism, et cetera, taking off from, from um, failure of the Enlightenment because that raises the question, where does language come from? So if you take an atheistic position that we were all primates in the jungles of Sudan and Ethiopia, and uh, we, we were fighting uh, with each other over mating and food, then the language evolved uh, because, uh, this is my parable, that um, a, uh, an ape, a female ape, has her child. They're all, the whole gang is resting on the trees. So in the morning, she gets up and there is one male. Uh, he gets up, he's leaving. So she asks him, where are you going? Because they don't use words. And he says that, well, yesterday I saw some very pretty females going towards Ethiopia. So that's where I'm going. She said, you're not going anywhere. You stay here, look after my baby. I'm hungry. My baby is hungry. I'm going to eat, find some food for myself. And there are pythons here. They'll eat up my baby unless you sit and watch over my baby. Uh, if you don't, I'll break your head. So uh, in these fights of uh, apes or primates uh, fighting over food, mating rights, uh, the, the sounds, animal sounds become uh, words, language, language develops. If that's the origin of language, then the postmodern philosophy is right that words can have nothing to do with truth. This is where Upanishads and Buddhism had reached, that in order to know the truth, you have to empty your mind in meditation. You have to... Now, they didn't go the way Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell went because uh, Buddha is already critiquing, like Socrates, he's already critiquing the myths, that the religious myths that Hindus have created or the Greeks have created these myths are meant not to find meaning of life and truth. These myths are meant by religious leaders to exploit the ordinary people. So, uh, so the Buddha has, uh, and Socrates has very little use for the myths, uh, unlike Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell, uh, because they already know that people are enslaved by myths. So a lot of the New Testament is critical of stories critical of myths, although at the moment the Western mind has been taken over by the idea that we cannot know the truth, but we can invent stories that know the truth. So I, I began to realize that uh, if there are five blind men, there could be a sixth man who is not blind. Can he speak? Is revelation possible? 
And as I'm reading the, the Old Testament, uh, particularly the boring books of the Old Testament, I begin to realize that the book is claiming to be God's word, and there are umpteen prophecies within Kings and Chronicles that are fulfilled during the lifetime of the, the period of the kings themselves. So uh, I began to take the concept of revelation seriously because also it, it also explained the origin of language much better than the evolutionists did how language evolved. Okay, so you view in, in your book, um, particularly in, uh, let's see, in the book that made your world, you present a viewpoint that's pretty positively predisposed to science and technology and the Enlightenment, at least the early periods of the Enlightenment, but you see them as inextricably, inextricably rooted in a biblical underlay, and that as they became more and more divorced from that biblical underlay, the more postmodern deviations from the Enlightenment pathway or from the productive Enlightenment pathway manifested themselves. And you also make the case that, well, in India, for example, which which I found very interesting, that the the distribution of the Bible in the native languages of the land had a revolutionary effect, and that that effect was also manifested in a broad sense in the West uh, against the Catholic Church and against well everything that and against arbitrary political power, political and economic power. Uh, that, that's correct. Uh, the in Scottish Enlightenment, there was no atheist. In American Enlightenment, there were no atheists. In British and Enlight English Enlightenment, only Thomas Hobbes was the atheist. It was only when you come to the French Enlightenment that you have atheists. Uh, and the con end result of uh, uh, French Enlightenment was disaster. Uh, our universities were telling us, the Department of Politics, etc., were telling us that our freedoms come from Rousseau, Voltaire, French uh, Revolution. But they were also telling us that within three years of the start of the French Revolution, the revolutionaries themselves described their rule as a reign of terror. And within 10 years, the whole revolution ended with the dictatorship yeah. of Napoleon Bonaparte. So uh, the, the I began to realize that our professors were not Either they didn't know the truth, that they had been deceived by American universities, uh, like ancient philosophy, political philosophy begins with Plato, Republic. Plato, so the professors are saying that democracy came from Greek city-states, but they are also telling me that Plato says that democracy is the worst of all political systems. He hated democracy because it was Athenian democracy that killed Socrates in order to defend the myths. So uh, professors clearly don't know how we got democracy, etc. So yes, as I looked at the Enlightenment, and it was, of course, later David Gress, uh, his book From Plato to NATO, uh, that helped me understand why American universities had deceived themselves and a whole century of uh, young people believing that the freedoms came from Greece. Mm -hmm. Only thing Greece ever exported... And from was, the Enlightenment, for that matter. Yes. But but if it, the Enlightenment's rooted in biblical ideas, I mean, what I another thing I found particularly interesting about your book is your insistence, and I, I believe this to be the case, that the idea of natural right is embedded in a biblical conception of the sovereignty of the individual and the divine worth of the individual. And I, I think that case is pretty clear historically in relationship to the American Declaration of Independence, but I also think it's clear, and you do a lovely job of developing this, it's clear that the roots of that idea were essentially biblical, the, 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 bo bo derived both from the Old Testament and from the New Testament, particularly Genesis and the Gospels. Uh, uh, that's correct. So going back to those very boring historical books in the Bible, uh, here is... Uh, King Ahab, married to Jezebel. Naboth, his neighbor, ordinary peasant, has a very good vineyard. The king wants that vineyard. He wants mm -hmm. to pay for it. Uh, Naboth says, no, I don't have the right to sell it because my forefathers built it up. 
It belongs to my children and grandchildren. The king says, I'll give you double the price, 10 times the market price. He says, sorry, I, I don't want to sell it. I can't sell it. This is not mine to sell. No, the king is sulking. Jezebel says to him, what's wrong? He says, well, I offered 10 times the market price to this fellow and I offered alternative vineyard to him. He won't sell it to me. So she says, what do you mean? Are you a king? My father is a king in Sidon. Uh, do you know how to rule? I'll get you the land. So she writes a letter to the village elders to have a feast, bring some scoundrels to make false allegations, false witnesses, stone that fellow. She takes the vineyard, gives it to Elijah, uh, gives it to Ahab, the king. Elijah, the prophet, is furious. He goes to Ahab and he confronts him that you have broken every one of God's commandments. You have coveted your neighbor's vineyard. You have lied about him, that he has blasphemed God and king. You have killed him when God says you shall not kill. You may be the king, but there is a law above you, which is God's law. You shall not kill. That's the law that gives inalienable right to life. You have been given the authority to rule in order to defend the fundamental inalienable right to life and property and freedom, uh, but you have violated everything. Therefore, Elijah judges the king and the queen, and his prophecies turn out to be true. That this is what yeah. is going to happen, that uh, Jezebel's blood will be licked by the dogs, uh, as uh, what has happened to Nebuchadnezzar's blood. So it is as I'm reading these books, I began to realize that this is the source of the idea of, in India, we call it fundamental rights to life, mm -hmm. liberty, and of the rule of law, yeah. and of and the, the rule, rule of law, which is yes. right, right, because the rule of law is predicated on an, idea, on an idea that there's a moral order that's superordinate even to the king or the emperor. And that's a transcendent moral order that doesn't lie in the hands of any given individual. And it is definitely the case that in those old biblical texts, the prophetic voice, but not always the winners, as you pointed out, but the, the prophetic voice that carries the main narrative line continually insists that if those transcendent ethical rules are violated, even by the rulers, who you would think is it's their prerogative to set whatever rules they want, if there's no order outside of them, even... Even the rulers are told by the prophets that they're subor necessarily subordinate to those rules and that all hell will break loose if they break them. Yeah, th this, of course, became very personal for me when I started this research and writing, because there had been a hailstorm in 1980, which had flattened the wheat crop in 100 villages. I began to organize relief, and the district magistrate sent me an order formal order that uh, your work is illegal, stop it. Because there is a law in our state that in the event of natural calamity, you, uh, no private parties cannot collect donations. So I gave a formal response. Uh, thank you for telling me about this law. We will obey it. We will not collect any donation. We will give. So I gave a second order that if you're not collecting any donation, how can you give? So your work is illegal. So uh, stop it. So I wrote formally that the scriptures uh, command us to obey the magistrates. So we will obey your order. We will not give any relief, but we will ask the peasants who are hurting to pray for relief. Maybe the government itself will grant the relief. I got a third order that your prayer meeting is illegal. Now, this was not a Christian meeting in a church. This was in Gandhi ashram. Uh, the Gandhian style of prayer was very theistic prayer. So Gandhi Ashram would be watching us for several years of what we are doing with the poor. They invited me to hold a public prayer meeting in their premises. And the district magistrate says, this will disturb the peace and tranquility, law and order of my district. So your prayer meeting is banned. Now, am I now required by the Bible to obey the magistrate or is there a right do I have a right to civil disobedience? And as we began to look at this... Or responsibility, or responsibility yeah, for exactly. civil disobedience, right? Yes, exactly. To be a shepherd, do I have to stand up against the wolves? And uh, I was finally thrown into jail 
That's where I began to take a fresh look at the New Testament, that Jesus is doing good. Apostles are doing good, healing, preaching, teaching about the kingdom of God. Why is he crucified? Why are they being stoned? Why are they being killed? Why are they the troublemakers turning the world upside down? And that's exactly the point that you made, that the uh, rulers, uh, government has authority as the uh, Declaration of Independence in the American Constitution says that governments are constituted to defend and promote the laws that are given by the creator. Every person is made in God's image and endowed by his creator with inalienable rights. You give up that biblical framework that the rights come from God, his command you shall not kill. The superintendent of police, highly educated officer, he called me to his home. I sat in his uh, living uh, in his lawn in an easy chair for one and a half hours. He spent an hour telling me that if you don't cancel that prayer meeting, I will personally kill you. I don't need to arrest you. I need no warrant. I will not produce you before a judge. I'll come to your home, take you from your home, take you into the jungle, shoot you, throw your body there. The hyenas will eat you. Are you going to cancel that prayer meeting? So uh, I said to him, of course, that I have to consult my wife if she's okay being a widow. Uh, and then I'll consider your request. He realized I wasn't taking him seriously, which I wasn't, uh, because I didn't believe that a highly educated, uh, gazetted officer uh, of the government of India who has taken an oath to uphold the constitution of India will have such utter disregard for my inalienable right to life, to pray. Uh, so uh, when I was in jail, that's when I began to uh, take a fresh look at why is an apostle Paul turning the Roman world upside down? That's what he's accused of. Why is Jesus being crucified? And what does the cross have to do with transformation of Europe from being a very intolerant, brutal society to a civilized, uh, tolerant society. Yeah, well, you know, I, t I talk to my audiences across the United States and say, well, it seems obvious to me, which doesn't mean it's true, that societies that, societies that are desirable are free societies, and free societies are predicated on rule of law, the law independent of the and transcendent in relationship to the rulers, and on a conception of man that gives every individual an intrinsic dignity that basically has a religious substructure. And that to the degree that we are citizens of those lands and we believe in the principles by which they operate, then we, we are bound to accept that view. Because without accepting that view, the whole system makes no sense. Like the foundation stone is pulled out from underneath it. And that's, a, that's quite the conundrum, you know, that there's a biblical vision underpinning the states that are the most productive. Now, the radical types, the leftists in particular, say, well, the reason that the West is um, wealthy and free is because it was built on the backs of the poor and in, in, in the West and also in the third world. But one of the reasons I found your book so interesting is that you're not so fond of that viewpoint. You look at India, for example, and as far as I could tell, you believe that the distribution of the biblical narrative in India has clearly been a net positive. And so maybe you could outline a little bit of Indian history, because I think people would find that very interesting. The British came in. India was fragmented into hundreds of cities or states, small states, ruled over in many cases by Muslims. That was the scene when the British arrived. And the British had their problems, but the, but the, in, but the introduction of the biblical narrative into India in your estimation, had a positively transformative effect, much like it had in, in Western Europe. Uh, you, th that's true. Thank you. Uh, you. You're doing a wonderful job in uh, arguing the case that you just outlined. And I hope that many people in the West and in the East will listen to you uh, because... Uh, well, we don't believe it anymore, eh? And that's <laughs> the thing. But it's yeah. also partly... It's because we're so damn ignorant, eh? I mean, yes. I was st struck by reading in reading your book how much I didn't know 
You know, for example, and this is very embarrassing to relate. I didn't realize, I knew India was fragmented before it was unified into a modern nation state, but I didn't know it was fragmented and fundamentally ruled in many cases by, by the Muslim empire. That I just didn't know that. And that's pathetic that I didn't know that. And I also, your book also helped me understand. See, in the West now, we tend to think of the entire Christian tradition as oppressive in the Catholic sense. And I'm not criticizing mm -hmm. the Catholics, by the way. Sure. That it was a, a, mono, a monopolistic belief system that was fundamentally oppressive. Now, your book helped me understand to what degree that oppression, if it existed, was a remnant of the Roman Empire and the Empire worldview, and that it was the introduction of the Bible and its distribution in all the vernaculars that actually blew the remaining empire part of Christianity into fragments, and, in, and then in a, in a very positive way. And that's an analogous, as I said, to the effect of the Christian or the, the biblical narrative on India, which, yep, so please, that's, please that's, go ahead with the Indian story. That's true. In year 1000 is when uh, from Afghanistan through Khyber Pass, uh, Khyber Pass um, Mahmoud Ghazni, the, uh, an invader, began to invade India and attack. So he, between 1000 and 1031, he came about uh, 16, 17 times looting primarily temples, religious temples, because that's where the wealth was. The kings will store the wealth in the temples uh, and he would loot the temple. It, there was a very small uh, Khyber Pass, only one place from where uh, invaders could come from Afghanistan uh, and Persia, etc. India could have built a small wall of India. We didn't need a great wall of India to keep the invaders out. But the Indian rulers never built this small wall to the point that 100, almost 200 years later, 1191, uh, Muhammad Ghori comes from Afghanistan all the way to Delhi, almost a thousand kilometers. Uh, and he fights with the Hindu king of Delhi. He loses, goes back. 1192, he comes back, defeats Prithviraj Chauhan, kills him, and uh, Delhi is taken over by Muslims in 1192. So what has weakened and, uh, the Hindu kingdoms from 11, uh, 1000 to 1192, almost 200, to 200 years, is a religious ritual called the horse sacrifice, Ashwamedh Yagya. Uh, Hindu kings are sending a horse, and behind the horse are uh, a few hundred young men. They're going into a village, either village becomes their property and begins to pay tribute to their king, or there is, they have to fight a war. So at, the, at that time, Delhi is small, a bigger kingdom is Kannaj. The two Hindu kings are uh, sons of real sisters, so they're first cousins. Now, one of the kings uh, of Kannaj, Jaichan, he uh, starts this Ashwamedhya horse sacrifice. Um, but his brother, who is smaller kingdom, but more competent ruler, he refuses to accept the sovereignty of his cousin. So hatred develops between two cousins who are governing two important kingdoms in North India. So after in 1192, when the Muslim invader has been defeated by the king of Delhi, the king of Kanna, Jaichand, he invites the Muslim invader to please come back, kill my brother. And that's how Delhi is taken over by Muslims. And then Muslims, different dynasties, different uh, uh, kinds of Muslims rule India until it uh, ruled Delhi until 1858. So and almost, how much and how much uh, to what degree were they ruling over the rest of what was India uh, as well at during it, that period of time? It, it was expanding and contracting. The Mughal Empire for about uh, 200 years or so was the most expansive. But uh, so the British had begun to come during the uh, Mughal Empire, uh, but only to trade with permission. The French right. came. The and the what was the consequence of the Mughal Empire? Well, in, in relationship to the to the typical Indian's life and, and to the structure of the state. They built the Taj Mahal. But they didn't build wheelbarrows 
for the laborers who were carrying bricks and stones. So you build pyramids, you build Taj Mahal, you build palaces. This is the whole Middle Ages. But you don't care for the wheelbarrows. So even today, women are carrying bricks and stones and mud and cement on their head as they're building four-story halls because you don't care for the poor. So India was weakened by what a religious ritual, uh, Ashwamedhya, which was supposed to make a king very strong. So kings did become strong. Nation became weak and divided which allowed Muslim rulers and then French and British and others to come and take over. So uh, India for a thousand years almost, um, eight, nine hundred years, was slave. Now there were pockets of Hindu kingdoms, but some of those Hindu kingdoms were worse, even compared to the Muslim ruler, like South India, uh, Travancore. Um, in right, and these and these all these rulers, Hindu and Muslim alike, existed in a completely exploitative relationship in relationship to their subjects. There was no conception of of individual worth, as you point out. There was no conception that the life of a slave, let alone a female slave, let's say, or even a female period for that matter, had any real intrinsic value. Uh, that unfortunately is correct. So let me give you a very shameful example of what this means. So. In South India, in what is now Trivandrum, Travancore, no lower caste woman was allowed to cover her top. Uh, if she covered her top, she has to pay a breast tax, which depends on the size of her breast. Hmm. Um, now, even the upper caste women in Travancore, this is Kerala, South India, they when they go into the temple, they have to remove their upper cloth because you're honoring the priests, you have to be bare chested. On the street, if a, a noble, uh, someone from noble family, royalty, is passing through on the street, the upper caste women have to take their cloth off and throw uh, petals, flower petals. This is Hindu India while the British are ruling in India. So, this, these parts of history are suppressed because they are shameful, and obviously they are shameful, that there is more slavery in the Hindu kingdom of Travancore in South India than in the Muslim uh, uh, kingdom in mm -hmm. the north. Mm -hmm. So, so, so th th this is partly because of caste system. So the horse sacrifice was one thing that had weakened India. Caste system had weakened India because if the kings are exploiting my wealth and putting that wealth in gold uh, and silver and diamonds in the temples. When an invader comes and attacks that king, why should I sacrifice my life? Why should I fight and defend my kingdom? Because I have no stake in this kingdom. You are treating me as untouchable. And this is what is happening in India today, every day, that uh, the lower caste people who are trying to recover their dignity, that the Hindu religious system has made me lower than animals. Jesus Christ is making me a human being, a child of God. You won't allow me to enter your temple. Jesus is making me a priest mm -hmm. of the most high God. So if they want to convert, there's persecution happening every day in India. And the Supreme, there's a okay, case. So now you also made the case that in the caste system, for example, that I thought this was very interesting and quite damning in, from a modern perspective, or maybe from a biblical perspective, not so much a modern, that there was no sense in the Hindu caste structure that the poor and downtrodden, and let's say the untouchables, were to be revered or served or regarded as intrinsically noble, partly because the doctrine of karma was predicated on the assumption, A, that they deserved their suffering, had earned it in some cosmic sense, and B, that if you did even attempt to alleviate their suffering, all you did, all you were doing cosmically was prolonging it, because the suffering that they had garnered as a consequence of karma was deserved and was going to be played out no matter who interfered with it. And so there wasn't just an absence of care, let's say, in some sense, 
for the downtrodden and the outcast, but there was an insistence that they deserved their position and that anything that might be done to help them would actually be counterproductive. Now, have I got that right? Yes, uh, except I'll take it a little farther. That is that inequality is self-evident truth, including in America. That men and women are equal was never self-evident to Americans. Whites and black slaves are equal was never self-evident to Jeffersons and Washingtons and the American founding fathers. Equality is not a self-evident truth. Inequality is self-evident Yeah, quite the truth. contrary, right? You could say yeah. that, that equality is so non-self-evident that it would take div divine fiat to make it a reality. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, I know and, that's a powerful and, argument. And Jefferson knew that. Therefore, in the Declaration of Independence, he wrote, "We hold these truths to be sacred, that all men are created yeah. equal." It was Benjamin Franklin who put pressure on him, and he was trying to please Thomas Paine, the deist, the rationalist. That mm -hmm. no, no, we we can't say that these truths are revealed to us by sacred writings. So right. say we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, I think it was it might be fair to say that those truths are self-evident in a culture that's absolutely saturated by Protestant biblical presumptions. That's but they're true. not self-evident otherwise. Yeah, they were not self-evident 500 years ago when Martin Luther discovered priesthood and kingship of all believers. Because at that time, if a Christian went to the church in Germany, average Christian only got the bread symbol of Christ's body, not the wine, the symbol of blood. The uh, blood was only for the priests. So the, the, the division between priests and laity resulted in war because if all men are created equal, if every child of God is supposed to serve God as his priest, manage his kingdom as a king, then uh, it, it, this was a revolution, a theological right. revolution. So what yes, and it was resisted. That was part of the reason, I suppose, that the translation of the Bible was resisted by so many people in the hierarchical church, because people knew they knew full well that if the actual words were distributed widely, that that would create a bottom up revolution as people realized their fundamental, not only their equality, but it's more than that their equality before God and their fundamental worth and their capability of having a relationship with truth. And there is maybe no more re revolutionary doctrine than that. You know, it, it hit home for me how revolutionary the book is. And even, even in Western history. Th th that's absolutely true. So uh, that doctrine of human equality, the first thing it does in Germany, 1524, 1525, is the peasants' war. Uh, I'll come back to that. But yep. bef before that, before Luther translates the Bible into German, you have Wycliffe in Oxford who has translated the Bible into English along with his friends. Uh, this is before printing existed, before Gutenberg. And, and wasn't Wycliffe killed for his trouble? Was he, was uh, he burned? It, 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 fortunately not. It, after he had been buried, his bones were dug out. Bones were oh, burned. Oh, yes. His bones were burned and uh, the ashes were scattered. But he didn't die because part of his time there were two popes, or three, at, for a while there were three popes fighting with each other. Each of them wanted British support. And uh, Wycliffe had become a hero in Britain mm. uh, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, over taxation. So the British was. So he pope. escaped that doom. He, but they got Tyndall, I believe. Uh, yeah, Tyndall if I remember correctly. Burned. Yes, Tyndall was burned. Mm -hmm. uh, but Tyndall is 150 or so years after Wycliffe. Uh, but okay, so, well, so that's that's even that's interesting. Even that that the resistance to the translation lasted multiple centuries. It yeah. wasn't a flash in the pan. It was an Z extremely dangerous act to translate the Bible into a vernacular uh, language. And you got to ask yourself why. You're absolutely right, because it was Bishop Arundel, the Archbishop of uh, uh, Canterbury, who uh, banned Wycliffe's Bible and prohibited that no one is allowed to translate the Bible into English without permission. So Tyndale spent a whole year knocking at the doors of three bishops, trying to get permission to translate the Bible into English. All three of them refused, so he uh, became a refugee. He 
uh, which was also illegal to leave England without permission. He uh, left England, went to Wittenberg, under Luther, began to translate the Bible, the New Testament. Then he came to Belgium. That's where he printed it to smuggle it into England. So anyone who was found 100 years earlier with a page of Wycliffe Bible hand copied, uh, he could be burnt at stake because the church has banned translation of the Bible. So the Bible was an explosive revolutionary book. Okay. In okay, so let's let's go back to India then. So now you have yeah. the Muslim ruling, the Muslims ruling India, and you have the Hindu gods or the Hindu kings ruling India, and it's a, a caste structured society, and there's no shortage of oppression, and there's no real development at the individual level. And the British start a mercantile relationship. And then the biblical corpus en enters the Indian landscape through the operation fundamentally of the British, but of missionaries, not the mercantilists per se. Yes. Although a fair number of the Christian influenced British politicians were all already pushing favorably for Indi India's independent development several hundred years ago, way before it actually happened. Yes. Now, a few missionaries from Europe had come to South India before the British missionary movement got going, and they had begun to translate the Bible into some of the South Indian languages, etc. But this was small private initiative. The missionary movement per se got started only in 1793, when William Carey, a cobbler in England, he was a Baptist, so he was not allowed to go into Oxford or Cambridge. These were Anglican universities. So he taught himself on while working as a cobbler Latin, Greek, Hebrew, geography, politics, mission, maybe history, etc. And he wrote a book, a small book, inquiring whether the contemporary church is under an obligation to go and evangelize the world, disciple all nations, or was that a command given only for the first generation of apostles? So his book, An Inquiry into Obligation, of the Christians to disciple all nations. It's, it's a very long title. That's what begins hmm. the modern missionary movement. But ironically, uh, 1793, when his book is published, is the year when the British Parliament banned missionaries from going to India. So uh, 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 the East India, British East India Company is governing Bengal which includes Bangladesh, Assam, etc. It's a large part of Eastern India. But uh, missionaries are not allowed because evangelical movement is already creating problem for Africa, uh, British rule in Africa, because British companies are bringing African slaves in British ships, selling them in Caribbeans and South America, North America, and evangelical conscience which believes that all human beings are equal. Therefore, slavery is immoral. They are creating problems. And it is the members of House of Lord in England who have taken these companies. They don't want missionaries to go. We're having a good time in Africa and India. We're making a lot of money. We don't want morality injected into business. Uh, right. But it does get injected. Wilberforce manages it unbelievably well. And, you know, yes. one of the things that I've really been struck by lately is this um, this this postmodern and radical leftist insistence that exploitation is wrong. I think, well, why do you think exploitation is wrong? You have to buy the doctrine of the inalienable rights of the individual and the natural rights of the individual and the divine worth of the individual before slavery is wrong and you don't buy any of that yeah, and, but if you do but if you do buy it you end up like wilbur like wilberforce and you put yourself on the line to what to cost cost england a tremendous fortune over a multiple decades to eradicate slavery around the world because of its moral inappropriateness because of the sacred nature of each individual uh, he, he, that's absolutely right. That if a woman is an animal and I can buy a cow, keep a cow in lock and chain and sell a cow, why can't I buy girls, keep them locked and sell them? Is a girl different than an animal? 
Does she have? Yeah, and if power is the if, if if power is the only force that is real and the only force that's credible, then obviously you can buy and sell if you have the power to do it. You can only not do that in some fundamental sense if there's a transcendent order, let's say that that in imbues each individual with fundamental worth. The inalienable right to liberty that a woman cannot be kept in cage because she is made in God's image, who is free. Yeah. So this. Well, philosoph- I've been thinking. I've been thinking about that practically too. You know. So think. Imagine it this way. So the reason that you have the right to liberty is so that you, let's say, you have the right to conscience, and you have the right to conscience so that you can make appropriate ethical decisions. And states depend on ethical individuals to make appropriate ethical decisions to keep the states from crumbling, which is basically the stories that go throughout the Old Testament, is that when all the individuals who make up a state become enslaved or become so corrupt that they no longer make appropriate decisions, the entire state is doomed and everybody collapses into slavery. And so you have... You have your freedom, you have your liberty, not so that you can do whatever you want, but so that you can exercise your conscience in relationship to your, well, let's say, divine calling. Uh, That's absolutely right. The idea of conscience is foundational to whole of Western political philosophy. That the reality is that in human body, there is no organ called conscience. Conscience is is an aspect of human uh, soul the spiritual dimension of a human being, where my conscience judges me, that you're lying, that you're shoplifting, you're a thief, you're a liar, you're a sinner. So conscience is um, the image of God in me, which Mm -hmm. can be corrupted, but can be reformed. So this this is, of course, the fundamental source of liberty when uh, uh, 1521-22, Uh, Martin Luther is standing in the Diet of Worms. The emperor has called for Luther to be tried because uh, the uh, Roman Empire cannot be divided when the Turks are attacking it. He wants unity. So he wants Luther to explain himself. And he says, okay, these are your books. Yes, sir. And these are the books of the church fathers. Yes, sir. Your books contradict the books that the church fathers have written for a long time. Yes, sir, they do. So will you recant? He's not given an opportunity to defend himself. Because you are contradicting what the church fathers have said, you should recant. Uh, Otherwise, you are a heretic. That means that any Christian can kill you and will go to heaven. So Luther takes 24 hours, and that happened just uh, two, three weeks ago, the 500th anniversary of the Diet of Worms, when Luther spends a whole night in prayer. That do I recant save my life or do I remain true to my conscience? So he makes that classic statement uh, that uh, I, it's not safe, it's not right to go against one's conscience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I will recant. I'm not being proud and arrogant. I will recant if you convince me from scriptures and plain reason. If not, I'm sorry, I can't repent. So help me God. That's right, where, here I stand. Here I stand, so help me God. Mm-hmm. Now, that doctrine of conscience comes from, Paul uses the word repeatedly in uh, his epistles, such as Timothy and Titus, uh, that this is the true religion, not all the rituals, not all the sacraments, but to keep your heart clean, pure. Right, it's the prophetic conscience. voice within, essentially. Yes. So that then is debated and um, Uh, Milton, John Milton, the Puritan poet, uses it in his argument for Areopagitica, in in Areopagitica, when he argues for liberty, to even if I'm wrong, I should have the freedom to express my false ideas. You should counter my false ideas with um, uh, arguments and evidence, not by the sword. Yeah, that's part of the refinement of conscience, you could say that. So then... At that time, during Oliver Cromwell's reign, long parliament appoints Westminster Assembly, Assembly of 70 or so theologians, who write Westminster Confession. Uh, Chapter 20 is the chapter on conscience. 
it was so the parliament accepts Westminster Confession as the summary of biblical Christianity. And it was through that that conscience enters the doc, uh, the political philosophy of the West. The, 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 the root of it goes back to 1528 lecture sermon that uh, and how does that how does that parallel wilbur wilberforce's emergence as an anti-slavery campaigner he he comes to 300 years later uh yeah but the the background of it is martin luther's sermon which john locke quotes in his letter concerning toleration which uh madison james madison when introducing bill of rights in america he quotes martin luther's sermon it's called on two kingdoms that there are two kingdoms, kingdom of Christ, which has come into this world, and the kingdom of man. The emperor and the church, the pope, have authority over me in some areas. But the church doesn't own my soul. Emperor doesn't own my soul. If mm -hmm. I have accepted Jesus as my Lord, it's God's kingdom has come into my heart. Christ is my Lord. He's the king of kings. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Therefore, my heart belongs to Jesus and the government has no business in interfering with my conscience, with my okay, soul. Okay, so now, now these ideas come into India and you talked about yes. the missionary distribution in the vernacular. And one of the things you do quite nicely, I thought, in, 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 in the book that made your world is detail out the effects on the language and the culture of the societies in which to which the bible was uh what would you say where the to the languages and the societies that were provided with or offered a translation of the bible because it meant a codification of the language and often the transformation of what was only a spoken language into a written language to the demarcation of the language as a consequence to the possibility of a written civilization and then also to the possibility of that society now developing its own literature literary vernacular as an offshoot of the of the biblical corpus the very interesting development of the word eh, as, yes. as a consequence of the translation efforts because yes. they often get pilloried in the west right because the yes. missionaries are seen as part of this oppressive western colonial movement that that the radical types who criticize it don't differentiate right they they just assume it's a uni a unipolar oppressive mechanism that's that's orchestrated from the top down and purely exploitive uh, uh, absolutely so wilberforce is a central figure in this three things flow out of his 20-year battle on behalf of india uh, one is permitting missionaries to go as educators because all the education was a department of the church. It didn't become a department of the state uh, until much later. So at that time, every teacher is a reverend, you know, university teachers, etc. Bishop is the chancellor uh, of the universities. So uh, Wilberforce is, uh, he fought for 20 years that it's not enough to uh, send only soldiers and uh, traders to India, we must, God could not have th their belief in providence that history is not uh, a mindless uh, series of accidents, that there is God. Or a repetitive so, cycle. Yes. Uh, uh, there is providence guiding history. God called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you follow me, I will bless you, I will bless all the nations through you. So blessing India was part of God's plan. He could not possibly have given India to British East India Company to be exploited, but to be blessed. Therefore, we must send missionaries to educate India so that they can govern themselves. So the it takes twenty years. He loses. Okay, so let, we should we, let's 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 not gloss over that too quickly. So what we have here is in the midst of um, structure that could have turned into a permanent empire. We have a movement within that empire itself that draws on its own conscience to reveal to itself that any continued history of exploitation, regardless of how profitable, is immoral. Now that happens with the slave trade and it happens in the case of, well, much of the British Empire, but particularly in India. So yes. they're working against their own financial um, interests in, in, many, in many ways. It's certainly the case with the war against the slave trade. A absolutely. 
And uh, so that's uh, very weird, right? We, we want to <laughs> remark on just how strange that is. That's yes. unheard of. Well, uh, let me ex illustrate that Africa point first. British ships are going to Africa. Britain is industrial country. It is producing a lot of things. It's taking them, selling them in Africa. Africa is not producing anything at that point. So the ships have to go empty to the Caribbeans or the America. Uh, there's a limit to how many monkeys and zebras you can take. So they begin to take slaves, which are needed in the Caribbeans, in the tea plantations and other plantations. So you take the slaves, and then they're making sugar, and you're bringing sugar to, back to Europe. So this triangle of trade, if the ships are going empty from Africa to the, to the Americas, then the shipping business in of yeah, and slavery and slavery can get a slavery can get a toehold because it's way outside on the fringes of the yeah. of, of commercial activity and invisible at least to begin with and in some you, sense. And if your ships are not allowed to take slaves, the Spanish will, the Portuguese will, so you might as well. So uh, when Wilberforce is fighting against slave trade, he is hurting the. Britain's economic interest, and everybody knows that, and that's why it takes a whole lifetime. I've read calculations that the British spent more fighting the slave trade than they gained economically from supporting slavery to begin with by quite a large margin. I don't know if that's true, you know, no, but... No, no, that's true. That's, that's what Adam Smith had already argued in uh, his book, The uh, Wealth of the Nations, it was published 1776, the same year as American Independence. And he argues that free worker is much more productive and profitable yep. than a slave. So, right. so that was true, except that that was an academic theory. Uh, in reality, the shipping company needs to take some, something from Africa to Americas uh, to make the navigation work. So uh, in the end, whether the slaves are more productive or uh, harmful, right, 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 is an is an economic debate. So uh, this is why Wilberforce is a troublemaker. He never called, goes to India, but he's important for abolition of sati widow burning as well. But he has two mm. main assistants. Zachary Macaulay is his right hand man again against his fight against slavery. Charles Grant is Wilberforce's right-hand man. Uh, Charles Grant actually becomes a member of parliament and becomes the director of East India Company. He is Wilberforce's right-hand man, again, about how to reform India, beginning with how to reform the British misrule in India, because he has personally seen that East India Company in governing India is a gang of public robbers. Ma uh, Lord Macaulay, the son of Zachary Macaulay, he's the one who called East India Company's rule for the first 50 years as a gang of public robbers, rule of an evil genie. Because the soldiers and traders who had come to India, they were basically riffraff of British society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like the conquistadors in, in, yes. in, in the New World. Correct. So they were looting. Did God give India to us? so that we might loot India. This was the conscience troubling Charles Grant. And he wrote the book in 1793 at the request of Wilberforce. It was not published in 93, it was hand copied. They had copies in those days. This was for the members of parliament because the charter of East India Company, they had the monopoly. So the charter had to be renewed every 20 years. And in uh, this was written to influence the renewal of the charter and to insert a missionary clause. So from 1793 onwards, Grant begins to play a very important role, although Wilberforce is the face, the political face of that movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they uh, fight for um, education and the parliament finally in 18... Yeah, they, they granted 100,000. Is that what yeah, they granted 100,000 pounds or they forced the, the distribution of 100,000 pounds? Uh, 100,000 rupees, which was... Ru equal, sorry, rupees, equal, yeah. Equal of the pound, more or less, that from its profit, East India Company must spend 100,000 rupees for public education. 
so that we begin to train Indians to govern India. Now, this... Right, again, a revolutionary, an unbelievably revolutionary concept. It's, yes. it's unprecedented. It's yes. anti-empire in the extreme. And, and uh, Lord Macaulay, who argued and finally won the debate in Parliament in 1833, he says exactly what you're saying, that uh, this has never happened, but this would be our good, greatest glory. Not that we are ruling over illiterate people, but that we found people living in darkness, incapable of governing themselves, and we so ruled over them that they became capable of ruling themselves. Okay, now, so let's take that apart a bit, because, you know, the, mm -hmm. the radical types, again, are going to insist that England, or that Britain, imposed English as a language on, on India, and that, that the fundamental, again, the fundamental orientation was exploitative. But one of the things that you point out quite clearly is that the missionary types in particular, driven by their biblical presuppositions, did everything they could to translate the Bible itself into the local vernaculars, into every language that anybody has spoke. And that's part of that general missionary evangelizing proclivity. I went to the Museum of the Bible in Washington. They have a really, it's a great museum, by the way. Um, they have a very interesting room there that contains virtually every one copy of a Bible translated into almost all the languages that the Bible has been translated into. And there's a variety of empty shelves, although a small proportion, that are devoted to the next decades. I think they figured the Bible will be translated into virtually every living language within 40 years from now, something like that. And so those biblical translators had tremendous respect for the local vernaculars. They translate, they transformed them into written languages, which was no small feat. And they enabled all of those people to start to learn to read and to think for themselves. That's, that's how it looks. Right. So and language... it's likewise the case that in Europe, the monasteries were the, the, the central focus of what became partly industrial production and also institutes of higher education. So this idea that the, the biblical world was, was opposed to education and to enlightenment in general, that's false. That's just false. It's backwards. Absolutely true. Um, everyone agreed, whether uh, Christians or non-Christians, politicians, everyone agreed that if India had to be reformed, vernaculars had to be developed. Because that is what happened in Europe. Uh, Latin was right. the language of learning, la language of courts. But with the Reformation, German and French and English and Spanish and Port Portuguese, every language began to be developed. And so, because that's what the principle of human equality meant, that uh, every child should be able to study in his own mother tongue, in his own heart language. Right, well, every every soul had to be reached. Yes, uh, but also uh, not just reached to be taken to heaven, but reached to become king because the Lamb of God shed his blood so that slaves of Satan are transformed into sons of God, serving their father, managing his affairs, doing his, his will in their lives, and making sure that God's will is being done on earth. So everyone becomes a king. And therefore, every, the truth of God, what is God's will? I can't do God's will if I don't know God and if I don't know his will. So everyone has to be educated in his own mother tongue. This is what begins, this is the thrust of the entire missionary enterprise, British and non-British in India. But the question is, what exactly will develop Indian vernaculars? No pundit, no imam had any interest in any of Indian languages at that time. India had three classical languages. Sanskrit was the language of Brahmins, but only of males. Arabic was the language of the mosque. Of imams and the only very, and the only uh, language that the Quran could be uh, distributed in at that yep. time and Persian. Yep. 
So Mughal Empire, Humayu, had made Persian the official court language of India in order to keep the non-Persian speaking Muslims away from the throne. So the Persian was a sophisticated language, but in India it was used as a language of discrimination, just as Sanskrit was used as a language of discrimination against women and against lower caste. So no Hindu Muslim scholar had any interest in any of Indian languages, the current national language Hindi didn't exist. Urdu didn't exist. There were dialects that these missionaries mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, began to transform. First was Hindustani. Well, right. That, and we should concentrate on that, too, because people don't really understand this. You know, when I went to Switzerland in 1982, there were still places in the backwoods in Switzerland where the people at the top of the mountain spoke a language so different from the people at the bottom that they couldn't understand each other. Yes. And so the rule of thumb for languages isn't, well, the language is basically comprehensible by everyone, but there are various accents. The rule is that there's an unbelievable multitude of dialects such that people in one village can't understand the people in the next village. And so then the European missionaries come in and start to codify and unite these languages and also to give them their written expression. First of all, developing an alphabet often. Uh, Correct. So um, this, the, the question that really occupied was that once you have these 100,000 rupees, Mm -hmm. how is that money going to be used? And there were classicists who were saying that we should use this money to teach Sanskrit, Arabic, and Persian. So there was already Sanskrit college in Banaras funded by East India Company and Calcutta Madarsa teaching Arabic funded by East India Company. But others began to say that, look, if somebody masters all the Sanskrit literature and all the Arabic literature, he or she is not going to be uh, uh, able to give to in vernacular, knowledge of science, knowledge of economics, knowledge of technology, of law. Of right. Computer. These these productive, these productive yeah. fields, which you also whose development you also traced in large part to the monastic tradition. Yes. So that's why it was the Anglicist argued that we can't educate everybody with the limited money that I have. Uh, we have. Therefore, let's teach English. So there will be a group of Indians, small group of Indians, who are able to read English literature and take the knowledge from England, give it into Bengali, give it into Gujarati and Hindi. So English language was brought to India to empower Indian vernaculars. Now, we have many high caste Hindus. Did you suppose that there's a single university in the West that actually teaches that fact? Well, a friend of mine took these ideas which you have read and wrote a PhD thesis, which was submitted to the University of Nagpur. Five Brahmins were appointed to study his thesis before giving him a PhD. They took five years to investigate his thesis because he was showing that every single modern Indian uh, vernacular language is creation of Bible translators. After five years, they gave him a PhD. And they wrote in their uh, recommendation letter that when his book is published, it should be a required reading in all the department of linguistics, that every single modern Indian language is a creation of Bible translators. Uh, and uh, yeah, his- that's, uh, that's absolutely unbelievable. Eh? And, and you, I, I just can't imagine that being accepted without a tremendous amount of resistance anywhere. Yes. That idea anywhere in the West. His book is called Let There Be India. It's a big mm-hmm. book. The shorter version is still in print. The bigger version we have to reprint. Um, but you're absolutely right that right now there are about 100 dialects in India which are being transformed into literary languages right, by right. missionaries who are risking their. These are Indian missionaries who are going into remote areas, tribal areas, hill hills, uh, sacrificing everything uh, in order to uh, transform these people, because a a civilization can only grow as far as their language will take them. 
a Stone Age tribe doesn't have, you can't teach science to them. You can't teach business law to them because their dialect doesn't have the vocabulary, the grammar, the structure to make these books available. So a Bible translation. What do you think? Of, what do you think of arguments that might point out that that the counter argument might be, well, why should we um, assume that the benefits of, say, Western civilization or biblical civilization, for that matter, should be imposed on these people? Why can't we let them just pursue their own development? Why should we assume that there's anything superior about uh, biblical civilization in relationship to Stone Age life? Yes, uh, that's a valid question. Uh, my wife and I wrote a book on William Carey, uh, the father of modern India, who was the main figure be behind this Bible translation and publications for the first 40 years. Uh, of the, the modern India. Now, he was also the man who fought against widow burning. He saw yes. a widow yes. being burnt alive. He fought you also have an interesting story in your book about a girl that was starved to death by her parents. I, actually, yes. But I, I actually, I also began a fight against revival of widow burning in uh, 1987. An 18-year-old widow was burnt alive. That's when I began to discover these uh, builders of modern India. Right, as part of an equally valid alternate cultural tradition. <laughs> yes, but the point I was making was that a lady speaking in Harvard University was showed our book on William Carey to her audience, and she said that here is a gentleman, a cobbler turned linguist, the father of modern India, who helped abolish widow burning and an American Caucasian white woman doing PhD in Harvard, she got mad at the speaker. What right did this yep. white Englishman have to say that burning widows alive is bad? Well, that's a good, that's exactly the question we asked earlier about slavery. If yeah. you don't buy the doctrine that women have in, have what in, permanent and and uh, divinely valuable souls, and and the kind of kingship in principle that you describe, then there's nothing stopping you from doing that except the arbitrary facts of chance and society. Yeah. You have to have a view of of the individual as made in the image of God and equal before the law. Yeah. In consequence before you can say that that's self-evidently wrong. That's how it looks to me. Exactly. So here is Harvard University teaching a PhD scholar that all cultures are equally valid. If a culture burns the widow alive, that's valid, should be respected. And what if it they gas the Jews? How's that for valid? <laughs> or what if they kill six million Ukrainians? Is that well, okay too? It, it, about the Jews, uh, they have very strong presence in Hollywood, so uh, Harvard would be afraid of taking on Hollywood <laughs> because there are some boundaries, arbitrary boundaries. But uh, the the Jews and Hollywood right, but but it isn't much of it isn't much of a leap from widow burning to 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 the exactly. Holocaust furnaces. It's exactly. just a matter of scale. I, exactly. So when we firsthand discovered infanticide in India, you just alluded mm -hmm. to it, this little girl, Sheila, 18 month old, being starved to death by yeah, her Yeah, tell that story, tell that story. That's a very yeah. interesting story. Well, I was, we had, Ruth and I, my wife Ruth and I had just moved into a, a, a village in the middle of nowhere uh, in Chhatrapur district, Madhya Pradesh. And I was writing my first book, The World of Gurus, which was later then published by the uh, biggest publisher in Asia, Vikas, and it became a textbook in many universities, including Cambridge. So in study of contemporary Hinduism was using my book. So that's what makes me an Indian philosopher uh, who studied Hinduism, written a book. So I was writing. We had no table and chair. We had uh, put a, uh, a small wood into the wall, and I was sitting on a stool and writing. 
My wife sat on the other side of the bed. My English was very poor, but she had had English education. She, she was editing and typing uh, my manuscript. When I didn't have enough work for her, she would pick up her bicycle and go into the village door to door to find out how many kids were there, how many were going to school, what can we do for those who are not studying, etc. So she ran into a 10-year-old girl, Lalta, and asked her, how many brothers and sisters do you have? Lalta said, three, maybe four. So Ruth was curious, do you have four or do you have three? She said, well, three, fourth is almost dead. Can I come and see the fourth? So Lalta took uh, Ruth in the middle of, this is one bedroom hut with thatched roof, no light. Light is, sunlight is just coming through the roof. And here's this 18 month old girl in the middle of the room on a string cot with no mattress or anything under it, unable to cry, flies all over her because pus is oozing out of everywhere, including her head. Ruth began to cry. What's wrong with her? The mother's smug. Oh, she doesn't eat anything. Whatever we give her, she vomits. So have you taken her to the hospital? How can we take her to the hospital? We don't have any money. Really? I'll give you the money. You take her to the hospital. No, no, no. I can't go to the hospital. I can manage the city. Well, take your husband. My husband. Who will look after the cows, the field? Ruth said, really? I'll give you the money to hire a laborer to look after your field for one day. You go with your husband. Okay, I'll also come with you. She said, to get rid of Ruth, she said, okay, I'll talk to my husband when he comes in the evening. So Ruth came back, started urging me, that you go and talk to the husband. I've done my job. I went back. They decided they're not going to the hospital. Why? We don't have any money. But my wife told you she'll give the money. Oh, we don't want to get into debt. No, no, this is not a debt. This is a gift. I'll write, give it in writing. Well, but we don't have the time. Well, my wife told you that she'll pay for a laborer. Then they got angry at me. Why are you bothered? And I mm -hmm. couldn't understand. Well, that's a good question. That's a good question. I, I couldn't understand. The only rational explanation, as far as I'm concerned, was that they really wanted to kill the baby. Is that possible? I didn't believe that. But I decided to use that to mobilize public opinion that, are you killing this girl? Why are you so heartless? Why don't you take a knife, stab her? Why are you prolonging her misery? They were about more angry at me. I found no support in the village because mm -hmm. I didn't know at that time that female infanticide was a common practice. Everybody did it if you had a second or third daughter. So um, I decided to, I pretended that I'm angry. I raised my voice that, look, if you don't take this child to the hospital tomorrow, I'm bringing the police here that you are murdering this baby. So one elderly man said to them that, look, uh, you better listen to this guy. He's crazy. He might actually bring the police. And in that case, you will have to pay for the hospital expense. Right now, they are offering to pay. Take it. So the girl went, a uh, long story, which I discussed in the chapter. Uh, twice the process was repeated. She spent two, three weeks in the hospital, came to her home, recovered. The mother will come and fight. And Ruth would say, of course, we want you to bring up your child. We will pay for the milk. You raise your daughter. But a uh, second time, within two days, the child was dead. I was convinced that the parents had killed her. Ruth didn't believe that it was possible for a parent to kill their child. Uh, until we saw three or four other kids being killed by their parents because uh, one woman came, she saw all of this struggle. She had just had twins. She wanted us to take the weaker and the darker kid. And Ru we had just had our own baby. And Ruth said, no, I'll give you the money. I can't take responsibility for a second child. And next day, the child was dead. So we saw instances like that. Uh, and then yeah. we realized that it is not self-evident to these people that every child has an inalienable right to life. That's our yep. worldview. And it's not just, they're not bad people. They're doing what everybody else does. 
a second daughter is a liability. Uh, one daughter is enough to look after the siblings, to cook, to clean. Yeah, uh, well, wh one whether they're bad or not is not the issue in yes. some real fundamental sense. The issue is whether or not that is bad, you know, in, in its multidimensional reality. And you can be a relativist and you can say, well, you know, those are the breaks given the socioeconomic conditions. But then you have to say, well, then it's okay for people to kill their daughters. It's like, well, maybe that's not okay. Like, seriously. And that's a, that's a strange case because you have to come down on one side or the other. Either it's okay or it isn't. Those are the only options. So, so imagine there is no law that you shall not kill your child. Then it is culture. Everybody does it. Why shouldn't I? Does the culture decide whether killing an unwanted girl is right or wrong. Or well, the Nuremberg it, decision was that the culture doesn't get to decide. Yes, so, but, right? But, Fundamentally, but the, that was the Nuremberg the, decision. But the Americans had the dominant power at that time to overrule the fascist argument. The fascists right? ran. But, but the thing is, if you dispense with it, you have to dispense with the Nuremberg judgment. And then the, what the what the Germans did in World War II was just a matter of culture. Like yes. these these ideas, they have some pretty. I know you know this. I'm not yeah. telling you this. Yeah. Obviously, you know it, but mm -hmm. lots of people don't know it. Okay, so we're going to run out of time, and I'm I don't want that. But I would like to. So I'd like to close this properly, and I would like, in all likelihood, to talk to you again, especially about your newer projects, your pr work on Islam, for example. I think that would be a great discussion. But let's go back to the effect. The effect of the biblical revolution in India. Maybe you could just flesh that out for people. And, and I know sure. that's a terribly complicated thing to do. No, no, we, we can do the simple thing from where we began. So uh, this money is available. Dialects are being turned into languages so that every child has an opportunity to study, which it had never happened that the son of a shepherd will learn to read, write, do mathematics son of a fisherman, a carpenter. This has never happened. So uh, the nation begins to rise up. Mughal are ruling Delhi for 250 years. They haven't built one hospital for women in Delhi. The first hospital in Delhi is St. Stephen's Hospital, which was born because of a 16-year-old English girl, Priscilla. She comes because her brother had been killed in uh, seven, uh, 1857 uh, revolt. She comes to bless those who had killed her brother. And she sits by the river king Yamuna in uh, Darya Ganj in uh, Delhi and with its chest uh, of medicines, begin to give free medicines to women who have no one. So here you have the Mughal Empire for 250 years in Delhi, has not built one hospital for women in India, for their own women in Delhi, when a 16-year-old girl comes and, because Jesus said, mm. said, go and preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. So that compassion, which the, the upper caste Indians just cannot understand because they don't have that compassion, they're using medicine to make money, uh, there are exceptions, but by and large, mm -hmm. the, the, the medicine has become a greed-driven business. It's not a ministry of compassion, uh, which it used to be. Uh, so agriculture, Indian agriculture is transformed. William Carey himself, in 1820, he establishes the first agri-horticultural society in Calcutta. No such society exists anywhere. He's not copying anything from England. He's realizing, because Charles Brandt has written in 1793, the pathetic state of agriculture in India. So beginning with William Carey, uh, the, all the builders of dams and irrigation canals, uh, uh, Sam Higginbottom, uh, I, I'm, I was professor in Sam Higginbottom University, it was an institute when the book was published. Now it's a university, a Sam Higginbottom University of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences. Finally, uh, Norman Burlock, the father of Green Revolution. Mm -hmm. in Green India, Revolution, yeah. The entire transformation of Indian agriculture is a fruit of the Bible.
because this is what Isaiah has prophesied, that uh, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord will be lifted up. Nations will flock to study God's law. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, the instruments of agriculture and horticulture. Because the Bible sees the curse upon the ground, that ground will grow thorns and thistles. You will have to eat of the sweat of your brow. The sin is not something that just takes your soul to hell. Sin results in curse upon the land, agricultural productivity. And, to and, yeah, and, and toil. destructive toil, to toil. which you, you said, right. Within, and one of the things you pointed out was that although there was tremendous respect. So there's the sin-like aspect of toil, but there's tremendous respect in the biblical corpus for the idea of productive work as opposed to pointless toil Correct. and the multiplication of work for the ennoblement of people. Yes, I have that uh, very important chapter on uh, the rise of technology. When you refer to the, uh, the wealth of uh, Europe came from uh, colonial exploitation, that nonsense which is talked about. The countries such as Switzerland, which never colonized anyone. Finland, uh, which never colonized anyone. It was itself a colony of Sweden for several hundred years, and then for Russia of several hundred years. These nations have blossomed because of the intellectual and transformation, including uh, the work, work ethic, etc. Right. So this is what the Bible brings to India. Although as the universities have removed the Bible, Indians don't know uh, their own history. It's very Yeah, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah, it's very embarrassing for a Hindu historian to admit uh, that it is simple 16-year-old girl who is just obeying Christ in compassion that leads to the foundation of the first important, uh, first, first hospital in Delhi, etc. Uh, but the entire transformation of agriculture, medicine, education, the transformation of languages that we have talked about. Um, and, then, and then eventually the, the political transformation and the emancipation of India. F free press, law, legal system, that we have 4,000 4, years of history and prehistory. Not a single civilization has given us a concept of rule of law, equality before law, justice for all, the creation of civil services, the, which is called the steel frame of, in, of India. It was sons of the pastors, of poor pastors in England. They sent their sons to India to build the Indian civil services and the police force. Right. But, well, that's part of that. And that's part of that strange notion, too, that that's biblical, I think, in its essence, that to lead is in the truest sense to serve. And yes. to lead is in the truest sense to serve those who need to be served most. And that that's the highest possible ethical calling, which is a very strange. That's certainly not a Brahmin doctrine. No, the doctrine there, the doctrine in any society that has an explicit or implicit caste system, and that's pretty much any society, I would say, that's virtually any society, perhaps, that doesn't have a biblical orientation, is that why in the world would you serve subordinates? That's, that's, that's completely beyond comprehension. All that does is demean you. Yes, yes. Um, it's, a, it's a transformation of leadership. The, our first prime minister used to say that I'm prime minister, which means that I'm the first servant. Prime minister. Minister is a servant. Now, I heard him when I was only 13 years old, and I knew that he is saying that modern India had a political revolution where kings began to lose their power, servants began to increase their power. The first servant became the most important office. So this revolution began uh, the night before Good Friday when the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, got up from the dining table, put on the robe of a servant, took a basin of water, started washing the feet of his disciples. And he said that the new kingdom that I have brought is different from the kingdoms of this world. Their rulers lord it over them. 
But amongst you, whoever wants to be the greatest will become the servant. So this political revolution came into India, but we are losing it. Political office now means the right to loot. Uh, education now means a university degree is a license to loot. That's why our nations are as corrupt as they are, because the, the, all the senior officers, uh, bankers, police officers, they're highly educated people. But university degree simply means the license to loot. If education is not a transformation of character, of mm -hmm. making you servant, that you are being given this privilege to serve your people, be a good neighbor. Right. Look, I think that's a good place to stop. You know, that's yeah. a nice ending. Uh, obviously, there we could talk for hours and I would like to talk to you again, as I said, particularly about your new work. But uh, I appreciate this very much. I just reiterate for those who are listening, um, the book, I would say that that is perhaps central to the discussion we had today is called is entitled The Book That Made Your World. It was published by Thomas Nelson in 2011. And it's a it's a tour de force, I would say, conceptually and historically. Uh, um, conceptually, because it, it brings to light in, in a very interesting way and in a non-Western way, which is also extremely interesting, the truly revolutionary nature of the distribution of the biblical writings. It's, it's hard to overstate their revolutionary significance. And then um, in terms of breadth and depth, while there's a wealth of historical information that is encapsulated in the book and it's written in a lovely style. It was very straightforward read, uh, despite its dense layering of information. And so, um, I much appreciated it and, uh, appreciate your conversation with me today. And I hope everybody who's listening found it thought provoking and useful and, and, uh, valuable. So Thank we'll speak you, again. Sure. Thank you, you bet. You much. bet. Yeah. Really good to talk to you. And, and, uh, thanks for your books a lot. Thank you for what you